This is the third session today in the Black Belt track, and we have uh, Laurent Bernay from, the, um, from Datadog. And um, if you want to be jealous, go to his Twitter feed and look at the view from their New York office. It is like, I bet none of you have a view from your office as good as his. Um, anyway, he's going to talk about deep dive in container service discovery. Hi. So, hello everyone. Um, so, my name is Laurent Bernard and I work at Datadog. And at Datadog, I work in the compute team and we're responsible for providing application team with Kubernetes clusters. And as you can imagine, we have, I mean, we have network requirements that are quite important at Datadog, both in terms of throughput and latency because we've got a lot of traffic. So, we've been spending a lot of time uh, looking at how Kubernetes is impacting networking in terms of overheads. So we worked on two main topics. The first one is CNI, now how to do pod-to-pod -pod communication and optimize for it. And also load balancing, and this is the topic I'm going to focus on today. So first we're going to talk about service discovery, then load balancing, and this is going to be the biggest part of the talk, where I'm going to focus on IP tables and then IPVS. And finally we'll see all the solutions, but it's going to be very quick. So first of all, let's talk about service discovery in, in Kubernetes. So I put up there a small definition, which is the one from uh, Wikipedia, and I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with it. So just as a quick reminder, it's a way for um, clients to discover by the, all the backends providing a given service. And this topic has become more and more important over the year because of microservices and also because infrastructure has become more and more dynamic both for on the cloud providers when you do auto scaling and so backends can come and go. And it's even, getting, it's even gotten worse with containers where containers life cycle is gonna be very fast. So new containers are gonna come and go. And you need these containers to register in the service and to be, to be able to find them. So here is a very simple example of how it works in Kubernetes for a simple deployment and a service. So I'm gonna do a demo and I'm gonna create these two objects. So the first object on the left is a uh, Kubernetes deployment. And it's going to create three different containers based on a very simple image, which is going to echo back the IP of the pod you've reached and give the source IP connecting to this pod. And as you can see on the slides, it's gonna be three replicas. And that's it for the deployment. On, on the right side, you've got the definition of the service. So the service is going to be uh, what is going to present all these backends, all these pods, uh, as, a common, as a common thing that we can access. And the link between both is what I've highlighted in red. So you've got a selector on the service matching app equal echo. And as you can see, on the, um, on the deployment, you also have these labels, app equals echo, that are going to get into own containers. And this is how the service is going to match the containers in the deployment. So when we create this, Kubernetes is going to create a whole set of objects. So first, it's going to create a deployment. Then it's going to create a replica set, which is basically an auto-scaling group, if you're familiar with AWS. So the replica set is going to make sure that at any given time, we always have three pods running this service. And so if one dies, the replica set is going to create a new one. Then we have the pods themselves, which are going to be created. And all the pods are going to be labeled with app equals echo. And then the last service on the right is, uh, the last object is a service itself, and the service is gonna find pods based on this label, which, and this is what the selector is going to do. Actually, there's an additional object that Kubernetes is going to create. It's called endpoints. So endpoints is going to be the list of IP address providing a service at a given time. And we're gonna see just how it works uh, afterwards. And, and finally, something that's very important is when you create a pod, sometimes it's not ready to serve traffic just yet. Okay, so Kubernetes has this concept of pod readiness, where you can have a um, readiness probe that's going to check if a container is ready for um, to serve, to serve requests. So in my example, I'm gonna use this um, readiness probe definition, which is basically an HTTP endpoint, which is called slash ready and it's going to give us a 200 uh, HTTP status code when the pod is working fine, and a 503 if the pod is not working fine and not ready to serve traffic. So let's jump into a demo. 
Okay, so I've got a small cluster of five nodes. So I have one master node, one etcd node, and three worker nodes where my containers are going to be created. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create the object I was mentioning before. So I'm just going to do kubectl apply and create the deployment as well as the service. Okay, I hope the network is going to be fine. Come on. Okay. So both objects have been created. And if we do kubectl get all, we're going to see all the objects uh, I was talking about before that have been created by Kubernetes. So you can see the deployment, the replica set, the three pods. They started a few seconds ago. And then you have the eco service, which is the service I was talking about. So what I can show you now is I can describe the endpoints. So remember this other objects that's managed by Kubernetes. And so I'm going to describe it, and you're going to see that we're going to see all the pods providing the service. So as you can see there, all the addresses are the addresses of my pods, and they've registered with the service, and this is how I'm going to be able to connect to, to this service. So if I look at my pods again, we're going to see that the IP address of the pods is matching the IP addresses in the endpoints. So you can see this IP address, the one I did in 15, 19, and 12, it's exactly the one I have there. OK? So now we're going to make use of this service. So let me create a small container that is, so I'm creating a test container which is based on a curl image. So it's a very simple container with only curl in it. And I'm going to use it a lot in the demos to show you how, the, how everything works. OK, so it's taking some time because you need to pull the image. And now I'm in the container. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to connect to the service. So first of all, I need to grab the IP of the service. OK. So this is how the service is identified in the cluster. And we're going to focus on what this means afterwards. But this is how I can connect to, to the service. So if I just curl this IP address, I'm going to get to one of the container. And if I do a while loop, I should be able to see all my containers. OK, pretty simple. And as you can see here, we are going to switch on our three pods because my client is going to be redirected to the three pods providing the service. So you can see the IP address 19, 15, and 12. What I also wanted to show you is I talked about readiness before. So let's look at the pods again. And as you can see here, my three pods doing echo are all ready. OK, you can see the one slash one. And what I'm going to do now is make one of them not ready. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to exec into this pod here. OK, and type exec. So I'm into the same pod as where the curl is running. And from here, I'm going to connect to one of the container and look at this at the readiness address. So let's do that. OK, the pod is not running on port. The service is on port 80, but the pod are on port uh, 5,000. So as you can see here, my pod is serving like a 200 HTTP code on the ready address. So it means it's fine, and that's why it's ready. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to toggle this readiness to false. OK, so I have a route in my pod that is going to toggle the readiness. And now if I hit the ready route again, OK, it's this time, instead of having a 200, I have a 500. And you can see that I was connected to the pod ending in dot 12. And if you look at the top, we're not seeing the IP ending in dot 12 anymore because the pod is not ready. So if I go back to my terminal and I describe the endpoint again, so let's describe the endpoint. We can see that now I have uh, addresses which are, which are the addresses of my ready pod, so this first two, and the one that are actually providing the service right now, and the not ready address, which is the one of the pod that's not ready. So I'm going to toggle it back. So I'm executing again into the pod, and I'm just going to hit the toggle route again. So like this. And in a few seconds, we should see uh, the IP address in dot 12 appearing, and it's back, okay? 
and now all our three pods are ready and providing the service. So let's stop this and go back to the slides. So how does this all work? Um, the way all this works is when a pod is scheduled on a node, the kubelet is going to start uh, the pod, and if there's a health check defined, it's going to do the health checks against the pod. And it's going to update uh, the API server with the pod status. So if the pod is failing its readiness probe, the kubelet is going to update the API server, and this information is going to be stored on ETCD. And then you've got another component, which is called the endpoint controller. And this controller is responsible for maintaining the endpoint object. So what this controller is going to do is going to watch for pods and services and all the events related to them. And when um, um, something changes, it's going to update the endpoint object with the new IP addresses. So <clears throat> this is it for uh, service discovery. I know it was, it was pretty fast. And once again, if you have questions afterwards, come and we can, we can discuss it. So we're now going to, to talk about load balancing. So there are many ways to do load balancing. Um, in, in, in the past, we tended to do it, uh, to do it a, in a very simple way, we're using DNS. So the way it would work is you would have a DNS address, and you would, would register all the IP address of the backend providing the service with its DNS address. And when a client would connect, it would get all these IP addresses and connect to one. This worked, but this has many drawbacks. The first one is most clients are only going to use the first IP address which is not going to be very good for load balancing. So one of the solutions to this was to use DNS run Robin on the, on the DNS servers but, and shuffling the IP address. So every time you get a query, the set is shuffled uh, in a different way. That's better, but still, most clients only perform resolution of startup. So basically, your application is going to start. It's going to do resolution, get an IP or a list of IP, and never do it again. Which is, a, which is a very big problem if you have an infrastructure that's moving a lot, because then you're going to lose, um, sometimes your connection is going to broke, because the IP address you have in your list is not valid anymore. And that's why both Kubernetes and Swarm have, have decided to use virtual IP to do load balancing. So a service is going to have only, as, uh, always the same virtual IP, and another process is going to be responsible for doing the actual load balancing. In the Kubernetes world, uh, this is usually done with QProxy. So QProxy is a component that's going to run on all your nodes in your cluster, and it's going to watch uh, the API server for, I mean, services and endpoint information, and it's going to update a proxy. And I'm calling it proxy because, as we're going to see afterwards, there are several ways to do it. And this proxy is going to be responsible to do the actual load balancing. So when a pod, and, when a client pod is going to connect to a service, it's going to use uh, the service IP, so the virtual IP, is going to send it to the proxy, which is going to be responsible for load balancing uh, the traffic to all the pods providing the service. So there are, today there are three different um, modes to run QProxy. The original mode it was user space. So in that mode, QProxy was running uh, in, the, in, I mean, the proxy was running in userland. So you can see it as um, a basic TCP proxy, like uh, HA proxy, for instance. So this was the original implementation. It worked OK, but it had a big performance hit because this was running into user space. So since Kubernetes 1.2, the default is to use IP tables. So in that case, IP table is used to do load balancing. And it's much faster than it, uh, user space was, uh, was before. And this is probably what, I mean, if you're running Kubernetes today, it's probably what you're running. It's a default for almost everyone. And for instance, Kubernetes in Docker is also running IP tables. A third option is to use IPVS. So IPVS is a much more recent implementation in KubeProxy, and it's still not uh, production ready or not, not, not there yet. And this relies on the kernel load balancing. Uh, so as we, as we will see later, um, when you use QProxy in IPVS mode, there's still going to be some IP table rules in some cases that IPVS is not going to be able to manage. IPVS is going to be much faster than IP table because it's designed to do load balancing, whereas, as you can imagine, IP table was not designed to do this. So let's talk about IP table first. So the way it works, if we go back to the same schema as before, is when a client is going to send traffic, it's going to send it to uh, the service IP. And the service IP is going to hit IP tables. And the first thing IP table is going to do is it's going to denat it. So it's going to change the destination IP to one of the pod providing the service. So the service is going to get to the pod. It's going to come back. And then it's going to hit the contract on the host and be reverse natted so it goes back to the proper 
client with the good IP sets. If we look in more details how, how this EC is implemented um, inside Kubernetes, and I hope you're not uh, too afraid of IP table because this is the part of the talk when I'm going to do about 10 minutes of deep IP table stuff. So the, the way this works is basically Kubernetes is going to hook into the pre-routing and output chains of the NAT table. So all traffic is going to be sent to a chain called Kube services. And this chain is responsible for matching traffic with existing services. So you're going to get a um, set of rules, as this one, where it's going to match the service IP, which I call VIP in this example, and the port for the service. And if it matches, it's going to send, um, it's going to use an, uh, the next chain, which is a service chain. So this chain in cube-sbcx, in my example, you're going to get one of these, one of those for each services, for each service. And this chain relies on um, an IP table module which is called statistics, so it's not a very common module. And it's a module that's used to, do, to apply a rule with a certain uh, probability. So the way it works is you hit a rule and you have a probability to, to, to actually use it, otherwise you continue in the chain. So as you can see here, when you're going to hit the first rule, we, we're going to get a 33% chance to hit the A endpoint. Okay? And then if we didn't hit this rule, we're going to get to the second one. And this is kind of misleading because, I mean, we have three endpoints, and you would assume the probabilities to be 33, 33, 33. But in order to achieve this in that case, if we haven't hit the first rule, it means we only have two choices left. And that's why it's 50% in the second line. And the last line is for the last endpoint. So we are always going to hit this one. And the last chain we're going to hit is the endpoint chain. So this chain does two things. The most important thing is it's going to denat traffic. So this is the chain that's going to be responsible for sending traffic to actual pod IP and actual pod ports. And it's doing something that's very um, surprising. Well, the first time you look at these rules, it, it took me quite some time to understand exactly what the first rule was. And this rule is for hairpin traffic. So if we go back at the schema, there's an HK that's pretty interesting and pretty weird. And that's caused several issues in the past. Is imagine if you're in a pod, but also part of the service. And from this pod, you want to access the service. So in my example here, pod 1 is part of the service provided by pod 1, pod 2, and pod 3. And from pod 1, I want to access the service. One time out of three, I'm going to be sent back to pod 1. Okay? So if you remember what I said about DNAT before, my destination is going to be changed to pod 1, and the traffic is going to go back to pod 1 with source IP pod 1, destination IP pod 1, and so the traffic is never going to hit the reverse NAT and it's going to be dropped. So the way this is sold um, by your proxy is when it identifies happen traffic, it's going to mark it for source NAT. So in this special case, traffic is going to go into the pod not with the source pod IP, but with the host IP. So traffic then can then go back to the host, be reverse natted, and go back to the pod, and this is going to work. So, so far, we've talked about services that are very simple, where traffic is randomly sent to any of the pod providing the service. But sometimes, you have application when you want persistency. So when you describe a Kubernetes service, you can provide, you can say, I want this service to be persistent. So, uh, you can say you can provide session affinity. So this is the definition on the top right, and you say, okay, I want all traffic from the same IP address to always hit the same endpoint. So if I've got sessions, for instance, it's go it's going to work. So the way this is done in in, in, in QProxy is also pretty interesting. This is relying on another reputable module, which is the recent module. So um, if you remember the endpoint chain I was mentioning before, that's responsible for denatting traffic. In, when you use persistency, this chain is also going to get an additional rule, and it's going to add source IP to a set. And then, when you, use, when you hit the service chain again for this service, there's going to be an air check command, which is also in the recent module, and we're going to check if the source IP is in the set we've defined before. And if it's in that set, we're directly going to jump to the endpoint chain without going to the load balancing chain. So as you can see in this example, on the first, the first rule in red, if my source IP is in the set defined for endpoint A, it means I've already sent traffic to endpoint A before, so I should directly go to endpoint A and not hit the load balancing rules. So we're going to um, look at this into more details right now with a quick demo. So you remember what we were 
uh, I'm going to connect to one of the nodes and I'm going to show you how it, uh, how it looks into, into that node. So you remember we had a service called Eco. Oh, sorry, I, I tend to type K because I do Kubernetes quite often, so I use K as an alias of kubectl. Okay, it's gonna, it's gonna show some things sometimes. Right, okay, so we have, we've got our service Eco, the one I created before. So the first thing I'm going to show you is how Kubernetes is hooked into the pre-routing chain. So, table NAT. Okay. So as I was saying, I mean, all packets entering the pre-routing chain are going to be forwarding to the Kube services chain. And if I look at the Kube services chain, this one is going to match my services and it's going to send them, uh, to send traffic to the proper chain. So we have several there because when you create a Kubernetes cluster, you have several services, but the one we're interested in is the echo one. So this is this one here, okay? With the service IP we, we saw before. And if I continue and go to this chain, which is responsible for load balancing traffic, we can see the three load balancing rules I was mentioning before, with the 33%, 50%, and no probability, and it's going then to send traffic to the proper endpoint chain, which is going to send then traffic to the final endpoint. If I look at an endpoint chain, so this one for instance, I can see two things. So the line at the bottom is the one that's the most important one. Okay, so this is basically sending traffic to uh, the pod with IP ending at 12. Okay, so this is what DNAT happens. And the chain at the top is the hairpin chain, the one I was mentioning earlier. And as you can see, if it's matching uh, I traffic from uh, source ending in dot 12 and also sends to dot 12 it's going to do a uh, masquerade to to make sure that traffic is going back to the host so let's now look at uh, an example of how airpin works so let's i'm just going to connect to one of the pods and from the pod i'm going to access the service so i'm going to exec into this pod here okay so this is one of the pods providing the echo service. And from this pod, I'm going to connect to echo. So I'm going to do exactly what I did before, except that I'm not going to use curl because there's no curl in this image. So I'm just going to do, I'm going to try and, okay, and type it right. So the service IP is somewhere up there. It's this one. Okay, of course. Here we go. And as you can see, we're gonna, see, we're gonna hit the three endpoints. And what's interesting is, if I look at my IP, so the IP of the pod I'm in, it's the IP ending in 15. So the source IP is gonna be always my IP, so the IP ending in 15, except when traffic is sent back to me. And as you can see on this line here, this is helping, and in that case, traffic has been masqueraded with the host, and this is how it, how it worked. So the last thing I wanted to show you in this quick demo is how persistency works. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify the service to be persistent. So I'm going to do, I have an, an additional definition for the service which is persistent with the annotation I was showing before. And so my service is now going to be persistent. And if you see at the bottom here, you're going to see that now I'm only, I'm always hitting the same, uh, same IP address, okay? And because the service has been transformed in, into a persistent one. So, I can actually show you how that works. So we're gonna look at the chain again and you're gonna see the small differences I, I mentioned earlier, okay? So IP tables. Okay, and I'm gonna look at the echo service up there. And you remember before we only had three rules and, and they were doing the probability and the load balancing. And now we have these three additional rules which are matching the set to, say, to see that if my source IP is a defined set, then I'm directly gonna send it to the proper chain. And so this is where the check is done, and the set is done in the endpoint itself. 
okay, you remember this line there, it used to be much smaller. And here, it means that when I hit this chain, I'm going to add the source IP address to this set here, okay? And this is how this is going to work, and this is how traffic is going to be made persistent. Okay, so a few things about IP tables. Um, a few, a few gotchas. So first of all, rule synchronization. So rule synchronization is going to happen every 30 seconds or every time that the pod or service event. So it can be quite often. And what's very important is uh, every time there's a sync, so every time there's a resynchronization, which can happen pretty often on large clusters, um, QProxy is going to flush all the Kubernetes chain and reload them. And as you can imagine, this can take some time if you have a large set of rules. And this leads us to performances. What's, I mean, is if you get to a, to a point where you have many services and many endpoints, uh, you, can tr you are going to traverse many, many rules to get to the rules applying to, to your traffic. And this has a significant impact in terms of latency. And of course, the one I'm mentioning, if, if you need to reload tens of thousands of rules, this can take some time, and this is going to, be, this is going to impact your performances. And finally, in terms of, of design, um, I mean, IP table was not designed to do load balancing. I mean, it works, and it works great because this is what everybody is using today in Kubernetes, but it was not designed for this. And this leads us to IPVS. So IPVS is a layer for load balancer that's uh, built into the kernel. It comes with, I mean, it's been there for a while. I think it was uh, the, the available since Linux 2.6 or something. It comes with many load balancing algorithms. It, it's very fast. And it, it will rely on IP tables in some edge cases, but not a lot of them. And what I'm going to do is, oh, I think I hit one of the buttons there. OK. Do you know? Thanks. Oh, that's, that's back. Ah, OK, I've, I've lost a screen. Thanks. So sorry for people on this side of the screen. It's gonna, we're going to fix it pretty soon. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to connect to, connect to another cluster. So the, the cluster I was using uh, was an IP table based cluster, and this one is going to use um, IPVS. Thanks. So I'm just going to do exactly what I did before. I'm going to create the same deployment and service. Okay, and then I'm going to connect to one of the machines, and we're going to look at uh, what it looks like in them. So I can just set in one of them. Okay, this one is one of the IPVS machines. So if we look at IP tables here, you remember this chain that was the entry chain in IP tables. This time it's it's empty. So the way it works in IPVS is there's another user and tool to manipulate IPVS rules, IPVS, which are called IPVS virtual services. So let me give you a list of all the services. And so here, it's exactly the same view of services, but this time as viewed by IPVS. So I'm going to focus on the one I just created, so this one. I know it's this one because it's HTTP. Well, actually, I'm going to make sure it's a good one. I'm pretty sure it is. Yes, it is. So the cluster IP is the one in, uh, well, it's the same one. So I can just do, so I want a TCP virtual service on, IP, on, this, on this IP and this port. And as you can see, I can see the three, uh, the three endpoints providing the, the service. So it's slightly different, but it's basically, I mean, you need to get used to new tools, but it's, uh, it, it works pretty much the same. And what I wanted to show you is, you remember doing persistency uh, with with IP table was a bit hacky in terms of the way it was done. And if we just do the same thing I did before and transform my service into a persistent service, and if we just describe again here, you can see the difference. The only difference is IPVS created this service as persistent and it's built in. I mean, this is part of IPVS. There's nothing special to do with it and it's just going to work. So here we are with IPVS. So we did all this. Well. So um, IPVS is not con considered production ready yet. Uh, it has much better performances. I mean, uh, with the drawbacks I mentioned before for IP tables are 
all solved by IPVS. And if you're interested in performances comparison, I encourage you to watch this talk, so Scaled Kubernetes to Support 5000 Services, where uh, they do a lot of analysis and comparison between both of them, and it's, it's very interesting. And, and I'm pretty sure um, QProxy is, the, I mean, IPVS is the future of QProxy, so I expect it to be the default in one of, I mean, maybe not the next release, but pretty soon. So uh, I've talked about QProxy a lot. There are actually alternatives to QProxy. So, for instance, you, you could use other tools to provide service proxying, and you can run a Kubernetes cluster without QProxy. So one way to do it would be to use KubeRouter, which is used to do pod networking and network policies, but also come with its own way to do service-based proxying, which is using IPVS. Another very interesting tool in the domain is Cilium, which is going to rely on eBPF to do service proxying. So it's going to do a transform uh, service IP into pod IP in, in eBPF. And this is, I mean, this is really promising in terms of performances and what you can get out of um, uh, Kubernetes. So uh, there's probably going to be other solutions. I mean, this is very dynamic. So I mean, this space is going to move a lot. So we didn't mention DNS. I mean, in all my examples, I use the service IP. So most clusters come with built-in DNS. And the way it works is you have uh, actually a DNS service. So it's just another service. So you have pod providing the DNS service with the DNS service IP. And so the way it works is the client is going to connect to this service IP and connect to a DNS pod, and the pod is going to give information. And the way this synchronizes with actual services is going to connect to the API server and watch for services definition and enter. The, so my service called echo, it's going to create an echo entry with the service IP of, of, my, of my pod in there. So what I should be able to do is, I, I should be able to show you that, I can actually run I can run a pod, and I should be able to use uh, the echo, so the name of the service, directly to be able to, to connect. OK, just for the time for the image to, to be downloaded. Here we go. So I can just do curl echo, OK? So that's, that's how it works. So something that's interesting is sometimes you want to be you want to be able to access services and pod from outside Kubernetes. So you have um, other applications that are not containerized yet, and you want to be able to access these services. And, and you want to be able to do it natively without, with as less overheads as, as possible. So a solution to do this is to run kubeproxy on these instances. And I mean, no kubelet, no Docker, nothing, just kubeproxy. And what kubeproxy is going to do, it's going to create IP table rules or IPVS rules, exactly the one we saw before on this machine. And then you will be able to access the cluster natively. So for this to work, um, it requires rootable pod IP, which means from any instance on your network, you need to be, to be able to access your pod through IP. So it really depends on the way your cluster are set up. On GCP, this is uh, native if you use GKE, for instance. And this is also something you can do in AWS with special CNI plugins. And I mean, and as soon as uh, you are able to access service IP from the virtual machine, you can also access the DNS server from uh, Kubernetes and be able to access services by, by DNS. So I'm going to do a quick demo of this. OK. So I'm going to search into a VM that's not part of the cluster, and so there's no Docker and no kubelet in there. If I do, so there's no Docker and no kubelet. OK? And the first thing I'm going to show you is that I have actual, I mean, I have routable pod IPs, so I'm going to connect to one of the pods directly from this VM. OK, this is not the good port. OK, so from my VM, I'm able to connect to the pod. But what I'd like to be able to do is to actually connect to this service IP here. And this doesn't work because, of course, I mean, my VM has no clue what this uh, virtual IP is. So what I'm going to do in another window is I'm going to start kubeproxy. So I should have it there somewhere. 
Okay, so I started cube proxy on this machine. So, I mean, I had to give it a cube config file to, say, to tell it where the API server was and to give it proper credentials, retrieve services and, and, and endpoints. But now I should be able to access. Okay, so from this machine that, has, that doesn't know anything about Kubernetes, I mean, it's not part of the cluster, I'm able to access the service. What I also did is I installed DNS mask on the machine. And as you can see on the first line here is I'm telling all addresses ending in cluster.local, so the Kubernetes uh, domain, send them to this IP address, which is the DNS service IP. And so I should be able to, okay, so I, I'm able to actually connect to the service uh, in the remote cluster using the IP address of the services. Okay, I'm good. Um, so here is a summary of how it works. So Cube Proxy is going to get information from the API server as long as you give it the proper configuration and credentials. And it's going to configure IP tables so my client is able to connect to the pods. And for the DNS part, I just added the DNS mask configuration. And so when your client is accessing the DNS pod, it's going to access the DNS service and IP table is going to route my traffic to one of the pods providing DNS. Okay, so, so far, we've only, we've only talked about layer for load balancing. And uh, there are other types of load balancing in the Kubernetes ecosystem. And I'm just going to touch uh, upon them. So if, if you want to do layer seven load balancing and want the ability to do um, path-based routing or rule-based routing on traffic, you can use ingress controllers, which are like resources, uh, first-class resources inside Kubernetes. Also, and I'm pretty sure most of you have heard of Istio, which is um, which many people talk about, and I know there was uh, there were a few talks on Istio um, at at the conference. So Istio is providing service mesh, and it's another way to to connect uh, to connect your applications using um, local egress proxy on all your pods. So it's pretty interesting, and this is going to move fast in in the future. So this is still very new, but it's a very interesting domain. And I'm, I'm, and I'm almost done. Uh, so the, the key takeaways uh, from this talk is, well, the way you proxy work is pretty complicated under the hood. And I said before that I spent a lot of time on it uh, for performance reasons, but it's actually not the case only. The reason I also did it is because we had issues. I mean, with some, some CNI plugins and some Kube proxy configurations, you're gonna end up having like weird, weird problems. So uh, have, being able to know how that works and, and will allow you to dig into it and, and understand what's happening. A, a very simple example, when I was working on the demo, I realized that IPVS was not working with KubeNet for some reason. So if you use CNI, it's fine, but if you use a built-in KubeNet uh, configuration, it, it, it's not working fine, there are some small issues. Um, so I, I talked about uh, service discovery a little at the beginning. So this works, I mean, this works really great. The way Kubernetes model services is very interesting. I think one of the biggest challenges with service discovery in Kubernetes is when you have services that are in Kubernetes and services outside, or services that span backends, both inside Kubernetes and outside. And this is still an open problem. So this is, I mean, I'm pretty sure we're gonna find solutions for this, but this is still very, very new. And regarding load balancing, I mean, layer for load balancing is, 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 is very stable because, I mean, we're all using it in our Kubernetes clusters. Uh, but it's still very dynamic. I mean, uh, many people are, are not very happy with IP tables, and that's why we've got all the work on, on IPVS. And also, I mean, eBPF is probably going to be a, a game changer in that space. And as I said, I mean, layer 7 load balancing is only starting, and once again, this is going to be uh, a game changer in the future, but it's it's still very new. So thank you very much. I mean, um, I don't know if you have time for one or two questions, but if we don't, you can ping me on Twitter. And I'm going to be at the data dog booth afterwards. So if you want to come and ask questions, I mean, feel free to come. And all the code for this demo uh, is going to be on GitHub. So you can just check it, check it out today. But it's kind of a mess because, I mean, I was preparing the demo, so it's not organized yet.